there to Laurie Schwab with the New York Cosmos. Still Johnson. Jones, this looks dangerous for a Brisbane Lions. Jones, a good cross. Johnson! Arnold's forward, so is Manis Lamont. Still Robbie Slater. Twisting and turning, getting that one across. Lamont! Manis Lamont! Play on, says the referee. Hayes is onside again. Shot! Teammate from Heidelberg United and another local product, Charlie Ankus. How do you feel, Charlie? A uh, bit nervous, but uh, I think I'll get used to it. Just get used to it and really put in 100%. And, and I look back now, and that's and, that, and that's exactly right. So if I have to say anything to young people out there or young professionals or young footballers, you know, Simon uh, had me at talking at a PFA thing uh, maybe a year ago, and they said, "What would you say to young players, aspiring young players?" And I would say, education. First and foremost, and education doesn't mean you know maths at school. Education means you know learn how to be present, learn how to be mindful, and learn to understand what you're good at and what you're and how you're going to achieve. You know your planning, your goal setting, and uh, and accept and enjoy the moment as opposed to thinking or comparing yourself to anyone else. Yeah, what a beautiful story! Absolutely beautiful story. And we thank you so much for coming and sharing it with us, spending a little bit of time. No problem, um, George. An absolute pleasure for us. Thank we you. We look forward to talking to you again sometime I in the future. I look forward to it. And I especially wish you luck in the coaching game because I think life's experiences and the journey you've had up to now yeah. is setting you up for something special in the future. Buddy. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very much. wish you all the best of luck. I'm joined by bullying senior coach, John Mizano. John, thanks for taking the time to have a chat. George, thank you for having me, mate. Thank you. No, it's, a it's a pleasure. Now, we were uh, chatting probably at the best part of two and a half years ago. We first came together in a studio and had a chat. And at the time, you were the Bullions under 21 coach, um, still making your way. It was uh, one of your earlier jobs. At the time, we were hoping that you, know, you would progress into a coaching job. It didn't take long, I think, after that, before you got the gig at Bulleen, um, mm. other than obviously, which we'll discuss in detail about 2020 and the disaster it's been from not not only football, but what a disaster it's been as a year, but mm. football especially. Um, talk us through that transition from being the under-21s coach and how it came about to getting the senior role and, and how you fitted into that. Yeah, George. Um, look, firstly, I, I just want to say that uh, that I, I I respect what you do, mate, and um, your your show is becoming somewhat of a uh, of a peer reviewed program because it's um it's very reliable, very credible, mate. So my uh, you know congratulations to you, George. Thanks. I sir. appreciate uh, being oh, it's, on you. It's, it's soccer people for soccer people. Pretty simple. That's it, mate. That's it. Um, look. Uh, yeah, to, when uh, the, after the last time we spoke, it was only maybe a couple of weeks after that. I um, I was uh, given the job there at Bulleen as the senior coach, and I've got it. Um, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I love it. I love it there. It's a great club. It's great people. Um, great, great players. Um, it's a great environment. I'm, I'm really enjoying my time there, and I'm forever grateful that the club has um, you know given me that opportunity. I'm working my backside off because. Uh, I want to give football a crack. I want to give the coaching, you know, that's my passion and that's where I want to go. So um, I, I'm, I'm doing everything in my power to, to, to make sure that I, that, uh, I leave no stone unturned. Uh, the, the transition, 
the transition was okay. Uh, it was fine. Um, you know, going into senior football, I think as long as you you understand the game and you've got some sort of uh, leadership characteristics and you know what your basic principles are, um, football and life, um, I, I think you're okay. And as long as you don't deviate too much from it uh, and you're consistent, then the transition is, is fine. Um, I've got a great bunch of senior men in my change room, great bunch right now. Um, we've built something really, really, really strong. Uh, there's a lot of mutual respect both ways uh, from me to them and them to me and, and my whole coaching staff. Um, so, so, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm relishing the opportunity now once football gets started again uh, to implement more things and, and to really enjoy the football because, uh, you know, we've all missed it. We've all missed it. And, and, and now it's really starting to, to really affect us in, in little ways. No doubt, no doubt. For the benefit of the soccer audience that haven't seen our initial interview together, yeah. uh, the chat that we had, um, you're a Melbourne boy, yeah, uh, a product of the old Victorian Institute of Sport, <clears throat> yeah, and under Ernie Merrick would have been at the time, okay, yeah, which is an important part of the whole story. Yeah, you've um, also got chosen to go to the Australian Institute of Sport, yeah and spent a couple of years there. So you were part of the elite of about 96, 97, the class of 96, 97, because that program was kind of like a two-year based mm -hmm. program. And you got to work with um, Dr. Smudger, our good yep. friend, Ron Smith. So yep. who was Ron's assistant when you went up? So I worked with, I think I worked with, with Smudge um, for about six months and then he moved to Malaysia yep. to coach. And then, he uh, and then Steve O'Connor and Mike Milovanovic yep. and Ray Juna took over. Okay, cool. So the, Rocky, the rest of the bit, yeah. Rocky took over. Steve O'Connor took over. So you're in that transitional phase. So you got to work with both of those because obviously Steve had a huge impact on on our player development as well as much as as Ron did. Yeah. Um, Ron was there yeah. for a long time. Yeah. So what you got what you got there is you got credible you know, credible people who were passionate about the game, um, who, who taught real, real football, real life uh, scenarios. They, they kind of, you know, did they teach you, did they teach you everything about the game? I don't know if they did. I think they were more like facilitators. They understood the game so well to the point where they kind of, they, they understood individual players to be able to allow them to flourish in their own environment, in their own positions, you know, within their, their, their physical attributes, within their talent, if, 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 if that makes sense. Yep. No, that makes sense. Well, especially when it comes to Ryan, I think Ryan identified players that he saw something in and then made them even better at what they were. Yeah, right. it's what, and really that's work, what, work on their strengths. That's what we were speaking about before, uh, Kotsi. You know, anyone can pick. You don't have to be a coach to, be, to pick the best player on the park. But can you pick a player that's got something that no one else can see? That's the key. And I think most, most of the players that were going through the system at the time were a product of that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, for the sake of this discussion, let's just put into a little bit of a, a pocket Ernie Merrick, yep. Ron, Ron Smith and Steve O'Connor and we'll come back. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So after the Institute of Sport, you found your way going to Italy, young buck about to take on the world. Yeah. Atalanta. Yeah. Probably didn't turn out quite as per your plans, but... It was all part of the, the, the journey. Um, in brief, knowing what you know now, why didn't it work at Atalanta? Um, I just, I didn't have the, the, the mental tools to be able to cope. Yeah. I, um, I, I was, I just, 
I, I thought that I should have been playing Serie A regularly, week in, week out, because of maybe the level that I was at in Australia, because I'd gone through the, the system <clears throat> quite comfortably, because I was always kind of part of the elite. Uh, and then maybe, yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand the fact that I was going to a foreign country where uh, I, I just needed to get my head down and, and earn my stripes, so to speak. So you went to Westerlo in Belgium. You got a bit of a, more of a sniff there, but yep. um, I think part of the problems that you faced there were, weren't so much about playing and getting in the team, but it was the clash with the young Socceroos and having to come back home. So, oh, Yeah, wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> so many, you know, as a young player, you think of all these opportunities that you had and, and um, which, you know, will all set me in good stead now, you know, for, my, for the rest of my career. But absolutely, absolutely. There was, there was times there. I mean, in the one year we left twice, qualifiers and World Cup, um, you know, both times were for like a month at a time. Yeah. You know, and the club's probably, you know, sitting there thinking, well, you know, we've got a player who, who we want to use because I was playing regularly. Yeah. But, you know, at any given moment, he's just going to decide to, to go away and play a, a qualifying game against Western Samoa where they're going to win 15 nil. Yeah. And they didn't respect that. No. No. We, we Australians didn't have enough uh, credits in the bank in Europe at that time to get away with that, no matter who you were. I mean, it, it, it was the same for Craig Johnson. It was the same for David Mitchell, Frank Farina, um, whether it was for the senior Socceroos, young Socceroos. We just didn't have the runs on the board. And obviously, also the fact that the Oceania matches and qualifiers ran as in tournaments, so that was a block. Yeah. They didn't run in FIFA windows, which is obviously, again, international FIFA windows, which, again, has improved made things a lot easier for the younger guys faced with this. Maybe it's a little bit easier. Maybe in another generation you would have been able to fit the two in and be flying back and playing a hell of a lot more football at club level and international level and enjoying it. But clearly it would have been a, a strain. And again, we'll come back because now as a manager you've got to deal with not necessarily international but about making decisions. Yeah and putting play, players in positions to make decisions. So, yep. again, another valuable experience, not necessarily enjoyable, but in, in the bag. Uh, you went to the Netherlands. You didn't play a lot at Helmand Sport. But I think the key was you made a strategic move to come back to Australia yep. and you joined Marconi. And for me, this is where statistically, from that point of view, your career changes for the better. Yeah. Because you come back and you start playing regular football. Yeah. You had two, effectively two full seasons at Marconi. Yeah. When you came back, were you always thinking, I'm coming back with a view to going again? Yeah. Or were you just coming back and going to deal with it as it went along? No. My, no. And one of my... my I suppose it's a good, you know, it's a, it's a positive and a negative. Uh, my mindset was, no, I'm only coming back because I, I need to come back and play at the highest level in Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, the financial, the financials at the time in the in the NSL, you know, probably didn't allow you to kind of, you know, say to yourself, well, I'm going to play football here for the next 15 years and make a good living out of it. So, you know, you you wanted to be amongst the best, you know, and earning with the best. Um, uh, but at the same time, coming back. I thoroughly enjoyed it at Marconi, you know, fantastic club, great people. Uh, Eddie Krenčević was there the first year. Um, and then Lee Sterry was there the second season. And uh, got, I got along really well with Lee Sterry. And, um, you know, he was probably one of the only ones that, that saw, you know, that this player needs to be free. He needs to be allowed to play and enjoy himself. And I'm going to give him the responsibility whereby... You know, he's he's the one that's going to win us games, and uh, and I loved it. You know, I loved it, and I flourished, and and then yeah, and then had fantastic. I was probably one of the better players in in Australia that season, and um, yeah, and you're probably going to come to the next part of it where you know Perth Glory. I was going to probably be their 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 biggest signing that season, uh, but I decided then to go back overseas. Yeah, so tell me about 
where you went and why you, you went there? So I went to a club called Green at Morton. Um, I wasn't supposed to go there. Uh, originally, I was supposed to go to Celtic um, uh, or Kilmarnock. When I got to Scotland, um, uh, you know, I probably, it looked like, the, you know, the deal wasn't going to happen. Uh, but at the time, the chairman of Greenock Morton, Douglas Ray, uh, they were in the third division at the time. Uh, they are not a third division club. They are a championship club, which they are in right now, um, or a Premier League club, which they spent a lot of years in. And he was rebuilding the club and he wanted some key signings to, you know, get the club promoted and do whatever he had to do. Yeah. Um, I, I was against it at the time. Um, and my agent, uh, who's a very good friend of mine right now, Lou Sticker, and uh, we've stayed in contact over all these years. Um, he said to me, look, Johnny, you're in the shop window. Have a look. Have a think about it. You're over there. And to be fair t- to Lou and to, and, to, and to the old chairman at Green at Morton, um, I was probably the contract that I got at, at Capolo was probably one of the better players, so better, best players, best paid players, sorry, um, probably outside of, you know, maybe the top three or four clubs in Scotland. Yeah. So it was a fantastic deal. It made sense and I was going there for a serious job. You know, it wasn't a case of, oh, I'm just going to go and play football. Like I was going there as a serious, let's let's get this team, let's get this club where it needs to go. It was a yeah. massive project with massive pressure, yeah. massive pressure. I don't think I don't think people realise. <clears throat> I'm actually I'm a hundred percent certain that um, a lot of people they've probably never heard the story, but the pressure that came with that project was I could almost put my hand on my heart and say that I learned how to play football from that moment. Mm. What sort of what sort of I know you're talking about promotion and your your yeah. star signing. Yeah, what's going through your mind? What sort of pressures? Well, the pressures was, okay, I'm, I'm not in the top league. Um, I need to make sure that I'm the best here. Um, the chairman has put his, uh, you know, money where his mouth is and he's, and he's forked out. So everyone's going to expect some, you know, the quality. Um, and... And I wanted to win. I wanted to succeed. You know, I didn't want. I didn't want there. I mean, you know, I didn't want to go there and just be a, you know, a bit part. Like I wanted to win the league. I wanted yeah. to yeah. win accolades. I wanted to do what I could for the club, for the chairman, you know, and for everyone involved. And and it was like the way that it was spoken is like we need to do this. There's no failure is not an option. If we don't do it within the first two or three years, then then it's just going to collapse and. So that's what the talk was all around it. Yeah. The supporters, who I'm still great friends with um, at the moment, to this day, uh, they expected they expected to go up immediately yeah. because they've ne- they never experienced the the levels that they were at at that yeah. time. It was a disaster. So I understand any chairman who puts up his reputation and his money on the line, and he's got a plan. And his investment is in players, coaches, mm-hmm. and the staff. In this case, so I get that, and I get that you're now a bit more mature. You've come back. You played a bit of footy at Marconi, and you're ready for the challenge. I get those two components. Taking on these pressures and understanding them was one of them. But how did you actually go about doing it physically? How? Did you go about making sure you produced? Um, I was just more professional, more professional than than I ever was. Um, it helped a lot that my brother was there as well. Yeah. So that was a, a massive emotional um, help, and we fed off each other and we really helped each other. Um, I was more professional than ever. I I was single minded in the pursuit, so I wasn't going to land anything else. Because the, the, the outside influences were still there in the sense that you're still a foreigner. People are still not happy that you're coming to take their position. You're still going to get judged more harshly than, than the local players. 
all the same, all the same external factors were there, you know, from when I first left Australia, except this time it was like, well, that's just like a water off a duck's back now. And this is my goal and I need to do it. Um, I watched what I ate. I trained hard. Um, I was single-minded in the pursuit, George. That, that was pretty much it. Yep. That was pretty much it. So the experiences of Atalanta especially um, come back and improve you as a person and as a player and you're clearly much better prepared having gone through that experience. Yes, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. Can, uh, through, through, experience, yeah. through experiences. Yeah. Through experiences. You know, if I, if I look back now, there's still things that I did that I probably could have, you know, did better. Um, but, yeah, through experience, definitely. Okay. So the, the happy ending, and there's a few um, really good uh, happy components to this. Obviously, you did win the league and you did get promoted. So I think yeah. twice in the three years you were there. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. So yeah. football-wise, very successful. Individually, so the team's successful. You have individual success, which we'll touch on. But, again, I'm looking at the stats only. But, again, it's showing me high numbers of games played. So yeah. now on the back of your Marconi two mm-hmm. full seasons, yeah. you've now gone and stuck in another 100-odd league games, probably cup games and whatever. So yeah. the footballer is actually finally settled in an environment that he's comfortable with, he's playing regularly, he's taking responsibility for all of his actions and all of that together is producing results for the team and individually. Can't be a coincidence, can it? No, not at all, George. No, and that's, you know, that's the old saying, you know, uh, um, you know, old head on young shoulders, you know, by that stage, I was 20, 23, you know, um, I'd had a bit of, you know, there was a bit of work gone in the background. I had a bit of experience. Um, yeah, I mean, we could talk, yeah, definitely, mate. Yeah, we could talk about it all day, yeah, for sure. But you're a wiser young man and, it, mm-hmm. and you start and get a little bit of reward for, for the effort. Yeah, but it's still... <clears throat> It's still not all roses. It's still not all roses because, you know, as far as my talent is concerned and my ability, that's not where I should be. You know, in my head, I'm thinking I should be at the highest level, you know, Um, and there's no doubt that I should have been, uh, you know, in in that period. But a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen. you know, you probably don't get the breaks that you should. You probably missed other opportunities, uh, but then, <clears throat> then, but then you uh, encounter other issues. You encounter other issues, um, like mental health, which at the time you don't understand what it is, and er- <clears throat> the environment and the world around you just becomes so difficult that you can't cope with anymore. And then that's when you start making decisions that, uh, that, that, are not good, that are not good for you. Maybe good for you in the short term, but they're not coping mechanisms to be able to last you for, you know, the rest of your life. Yeah. But again, you know, you're still, I'm still a young boy. I'm still 24, 25 years old. I'm still pretty young. Um, it's not something that you could speak about. You know, depression wasn't something that you could speak about back in the day. People didn't really know it. Someone would have just said to you, you know, you're better off just, you know, just drink, drink a cup of concrete and get on with it. You know, um, but there's so many, so many aspects to it that uh, society has changed now, George. Society yeah. has changed. No, 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 that's good. That's good. But it, that's the, the background and the making of, well, not so much the making, but it's the journey of a footballer and all of that that we put into the, the carry bag, as, I, as I've been saying, you, you add um, the, the great coaches that you would have had. Along the journey, you would have had some average coaches. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We, tend, we tend to like coaches who pick us and we tend to dislike coaches who don't pick us, regardless of their ability. That's, yeah. that's a given as a footballer because... Um, 
as a 17-year-old John would know, you are the best player at Atalanta and you should be playing. And in some regards, we have a little bit of an ego. And if we don't want to be on the pitch all the time, then we probably shouldn't be in that environment in the first place. Yeah, It's finding that balance between thinking I am the best and then maybe proving that's right. That I am the best. That's right. But, but, I'll, tell you, but, I'll, tell you, but I'll tell you what, even as a young bloke, um, the reality doesn't escape you. You know, you might be in denial at a, as a 17-year-old, but see, as a 27-year-old, you know, you look in the mirror and you, and you say to yourself, I knew then and I know now that I was wrong. But the, the, the difference is, the difference is, and I say this, I say this to my players and I hope that they understand it, is that I don't need to be, as, as a senior coach, I don't need to be making friends. Yes, we have great respect for each other. Yes, we have great camaraderie and great, you know, relationships. I get that. Um, but I, I don't need to be your friend. I need you to respect me. I will earn that respect 100%. I believe that you need to earn the respect mm. and I will earn the respect. You don't have to like my decision. You don't have to like it. In fact, if you do like it, then I'd be questioning you anyway. You don't have to like it. Um, and I know that you won't like it. I just hope that you respect it one day. And when I look back at my career, the coaches that I respect are the ones that were honest and that had integrity, even though at the time they made decisions that I completely disagreed with. Mm. The ones that made decisions that, it, that, that, that I even agreed with, that I even agreed with, but have no honesty and no integrity is something that I look at and think, well, I will never, ever be like that, ever. Of course, and you're shaped by those experiences and those relationships you have. So we take something good, bad from all the dealings we've had, especially with coaches and any coach now knows that they've been developed and moulded by every coach they've had at some point. Yeah. So you... you <clears throat> you might decide at a very the last minute as you retire, hey, I want to be a coach. And in some cases you may be thinking about it as you're transitioning from a, a retiring type player, getting a bit older. Yeah. And in some cases you, you know your whole career that you're pretty much coaching the team as you're playing because that's who you are. And you're thinking, well, at some point when I finish, I'm going to continue doing this. So you're absorbing all the information. But either way, the information's going in. So, you know, I can still remember conversations that I've had with certain coaches, good and bad, and maybe that's probably sad on my part (laughs) that I can still remember those. But I I tended to use those when I went into coaching as well. Um, And the good information then try and make even better when you pass it on to to the next generation. And the bad experience, you try to think, well, I don't want that to be the way that I communicate or that Mm. I pass on that information or the way that I want to be remembered either. So it's all that and it's the whole lead up to it that it's all, you're a sponge, whether you know it or whether you don't. So Because, you know, we, um, you know, what happens, you know, what happens in the future, right, is a, is a byproduct of what we're doing today, George, right? So you're leaving this trail behind of destruction or of positivity. Yeah, whichever, yeah. Whichever it is. So if you're aware of that, then you need to take the steps and the measures to be able to be the best you can be. Um, Unfortunately, being a player and having those experiences isn't enough. It's not enough. It's, it's, it's a great starting point. It's a great starting point. But, okay, maybe, maybe the coach that influenced me 20 years ago maybe only just influenced me out of a squad of 23 players. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, the teaching, um, as my good friend Colin Cooper said, it's like yeah. you throw, throw the line and you, 
yeah. you might have 20 fish listening, but yeah, you're only going to catch maybe one, maybe two. It's you don't That's get cool. everyone along the way, yeah. No, but what I'm trying to say is you're responsible now for those for that at that moment in time, you're responsible for 23 boys in your dressing room. You are, right? but you might not get all of them listening. You're not going to get all of them listening, right? But are you taking, can you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I have done my absolute best here and I've tried to learn and add more tools in my mental locker to be able to try and communicate with all 23 and try and influence their emotional behaviours, their psychological behaviours or their football behaviours you know, or have I just kind of taken <clears throat> taken warm to, you know, two or three players and, and and just focused my attention on the two or three best players and and then and then wonder why we fell short of, you know, top six type of thing, yep. you know, and then try and blame. Well, no, no, look at yourself introspectively first. You know, 20 years ago, if you kept your best player happy, that was enough. It's not enough anymore. It's not enough anymore because you only improve your team not by replacing your best player. Mm. You improve your team by improving 23 individuals. Absolutely. No, of course. And in in many cases, it, when you're involved in a club, you can obviously even have an influence below with the teams coming through underneath the underage, the reserves and the juniors. Um, if you have the ability... Um, and the power and the responsibility to do so. So I tell you what we're, what we're going to do because yeah. you've put you've got all this playing experience. You've travelled the world. <clears throat> you know to deal with pressure. You're dealing with it better. You get better at it. You're experienced. You want to get into the coaching game. So I'm going to throw up a scenario. You're in charge of an MPL team. Yeah. In Melbourne, it's a pretty well-established club in, in MPL2. We'll call it bullying lines, all right, yeah. for the sake of yeah. the argument. Right? Yeah. And at the start of this year, um, just say a pandemic hits the world and all of a sudden, <clears throat> pardon me, you're just about to start the season. It's very early doors. You've done the full pre-season. You've got pretty much your squad put together. You've put a lot of time and effort in, and then this worldwide pandemic of one in a hundred years comes along, and you're not going to play football. It appears for oh, okay. some say a month, some say three months, some are not sure. So you just you're on hold. But we're thinking by oh, okay, June, we're all going to be back training, yeah. and very soon after that, we only need three <laughs> weeks pre-season because we've already done a pre-season. And we're having Zoom meetings, therefore the world's a happy place and we can speak to our players on Zoom and yeah. put it on social media and we have a laugh. Yeah. How do you deal with that in February, in March, knowing that we're only going to be out for a couple of months and you've got all, this th- all these things in place? Your head coach, what are we doing? So the first... The, the first um it was it was shock, right? It, it's shock, and you you just don't know you don't know how to act. So you take you take a week or two to really let it sink in and to understand where you're at and what this what the situation is. Um, in that first kind of period, you think to yourself, "Well, we might be back in June, so let's just keep things. Let's just give people their space." Let's give players their space, you know, their families. Um, but let's also try and let them know that, we, that we're that we here and, and we have got something to look forward to. So just to keep on top of things, keep on top of your fitness, keep on top of your, you know, your mental health more than anything else. Um, and and pretty just, pretty much just empathise, empathise with everybody and, and show that, that level of understanding because everyone has, you know, everyone had different life experiences at that time, you know, um, some catastrophic, some not so much. Yeah. But um, that was the first, that's the first one in June. First phase. That's the first phase, yeah. Just 
let's let's get ready. Um, we will be back. There's something to look forward to. So let's just keep in contact. Yeah. What, what what official? I know it was hard because you, you technically you weren't paying those players, so you couldn't mm-hmm. force them to do anything. But yeah, what, what guidelines were you giving? encouraging, whichever, you, you yeah. tell me the right terminology. Yeah. What guidelines were you giving them in terms of being ready for this June-ish return? Yeah. It's, um, it, George, it's a hard one because I think it, 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 it dives deeper into, into people's mindsets than, than, than you actually realise. Um, I'm very fortunate that with, with our squad and our coaching staff, we have developed this respect for each other that we – that we listen and we understand and, and, um, and we take for face value that what someone recommends, then it's probably a good idea. Um, I, I believe that if you don't, if you didn't know your players individually as human beings, it would have been very, very difficult. It would have been very, very difficult. And I try very much so to understand my players as people first, um, and what impact the football has on them as people. And then you kind of marry the two together and you kind of understand. So the conversations that I was having were a lot of individual conversations because um, they're all different. And, and I like to think that I would understand what makes them, what makes them tick and what, you know, what, what doesn't and how to speak to certain players and how not to speak to them. But I think that uh, in today's football game, if if you can't read your players, if you can't read the person, if you don't even take the time to understand them as a human being, yep. I think you're on the back foot. Yeah. Okay. So there was outside of the, the beautiful team meetings that look good on social media and whatever, there was, yes. there was a lot of one-on-one. There was a lot of one-on-one. There was a lot of one-on-one. Um, and the discussions revolved around a whole lot. Some of the discussions, we, we didn't even speak about football. Yeah. Some of the discussions, it was just more about how things are, how, how's, but genuine, yep. genuine. Um, and I may have only had in that whole period maybe two or three conversations with everyone individually. It wasn't like every day. Yeah, of course, yeah. But those two or three conversations were meaningful and it wasn't, oh, look, I'm just checking in or things like that, it was, they were meaningful because I genuinely care. Okay. So in terms of team preparation, yeah. working on, did, did you guys actually, when the first wave and the first lockdown fell apart and we were training or some clubs were training, did bullying go back to training? Yeah, we went back. Okay. We went back. The boys agreed. There was uh, monetary things that we everyone needed to agree on because yeah. the season was shortened and all these sorts of things. The boys came together as a group very well, very proud of them. And um, we decided, you know, as a club, yep, this is the way forward now. We all went in there. Everyone dived in together and then second wave. Okay. So how many weeks did, of training did you actually have? I think we did maybe three or four. Okay. Cool. Times and- three. Was everyone on board in terms of did you have everyone back from in terms of squad numbers that you'd had previous? We had everyone except for one player okay. and that was purely because of uh, uh, job, uh, his, his job because he had to change it through the first wave through the whole COVID thing. Yeah. It didn't allow him to so then dissipate again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's a situation or circumstances outside of football which prevented him from coming back. So, okay. Yeah, but that was the only reason. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have this false start, again, hypothetical pandemic that's mm-hmm. going to rule the world and, and everyone else is just preparing to go back. Worldwide, everyone's talking about Liverpool and the EPL title and by this stage, Germany has started playing. Italy are on their way back. Spain... Remarkably, with one of the highest um, rates of death in the world, they managed to go back and play. And of course, tiny little Victoria, we get a second wave for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, we may find out in time what the real reasons were. And they stopped training again. 
this is going to really test clubs. Mm-hmm. But now, now as the head coach, as the manager, as they say, what what happens in your mind? Do you change your line of thinking? Do you continue down the same track? What what kicks in here? So uh, honesty um, and integrity kicks in first and foremost. Uh, you, you can't sugarcoat it. The season's probably going to be cancelled. So there's no point, you know, trying to say to the boys, keep fit, you know, keep motivated. Um, at that stage, it becomes more of a humanistic approach. You know, how are they going to cope in their lives with their partners, with their wives, with their families, with their jobs? Uh, it becomes more that. So then once you kind of go down that thought process, it, it's it's more like, okay, pressure's off and it's more just about um, being there for any one of your people that you respect, that you work with day in, day out if they ever need that kind of support, really. That's all it was, to be honest. Okay. So now you've got a lot of time on your hands, right? But you're yeah. a football person. And if you're anything like the football people that I know very well, mm-hmm. your mind's constantly on the game, right? We can't help ourselves. This drug of addiction of ours, we're hooked. So football manager, a player is generally thinking about himself because that's what a player does. Yeah. A manager and a coach has a collective thinking now. So he's got to start getting his thoughts around. Initially, it's kind of like, well, when are we going to start? I would imagine. I can't wait to start. And then you start honing in on the energies to what you really can and can't do. What does all this extra time do to you does it help you because you've got time to think or is it a negative to start with is that a negative because you've got all this time or is it a positive now you've got all this time to plan? no at the start it was okay because you just knew that it was out of reach so there was no point thinking about it um but as time drags on especially when you start to see other pockets in australia you know continuing with their lives yeah, football seasons here, football seasons there. You know, Europe, the football season's just about to start again. Once you start to experience that, that's when the anxiety and the angst and the frustration then kicks back in again. And you think, well, we are going to come out of this now. Um, what should I be doing? You know, what should I be thinking about? Well, the reality is um, that you want to try and implement, you've had enough time to think about 101 different ways of implementing new new concepts and you're probably only going to be able to implement two or three. So it's about uh, dissecting which two or three are going to work in your environment and can you deliver that to the best of its ability. What, What are these two or three? Oh, you, you, I, to be honest, George, you know, you think of, um, you know, you think of uh, analytics as one thing, okay? So the world has gone crazy with stats, um, with analysing things, uh, and, and I get it, it's part of the game now. And it's funny enough, you, you should mention that, you know, the, the, there's, this, there's, this real, there's this real kind of discussion going on about, you know, you know, can you be a coach if you haven't been an, an ex-pro, you know, or, you know, there is coaches out there that haven't played football and things like that. Well, to be honest, I'm open-minded about it all. Um, I, I think, you know, the best person for the job should get it, as you mentioned. Um, so we need to be putting in all our efforts. I'm just grateful that I've played the game and I've probably got a head start to others. But now it's up to me to work hard and find these concepts and be able to implement these concepts to make or to influence individual players, teams and clubs, Mm. you know, to, you know, to influence my club, to influence their behavior, to influence individual behaviors, to influence team behaviors. Um, What concepts am I going to introduce? Am I going to introduce 
some ridiculous stat that's going to cost me thousands and thousands of dollars to try and to try and, and engage in individual players that that I won't even be able to use on game day or in training. Probably not. It needs to be realistic. It needs to be relative to my environment, to my players, and 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 to where I'm at. And the statistics, the stats is one of them. You know the the match analyzing you know your, your own team your opposition team that's one of the things um you know the strength and conditioning component you know every year we try and implement one or two extra things you know so year one we implemented three things but let's implement them and let's deliver them deliver them to the best of their ability year two we deli- we implement another component to the strength and conditioning because we've had a full year of working with the other components. So next season we want to implement maybe another two or three things or maybe one. Um, but let's just make sure that we do it correctly and, and we can use the data and analyse it um, and not just be this gimmick that the world talks about, you know. And Because at the end of the day, George, I want my striker to score 20 goals. I want my defender to stop to defend. I want my goalkeeper to stop goals going into the back of his net. They're the simple, basic principles of the game. Anything that we can add to introduce to make things better, then absolutely. But how many do we do? And it's probably only two or three that we can probably implement. Yeah. Okay. So based on the environment you're working in and... Uh, with respect to the league and the clubs where we're at, obviously um, I best describe the NPL semi-professional. Uh, there's there's good money bandied around at the yep. at the club level. Yep. Um, so people are being paid, but it's not full time. But for all intents and purposes, with with lockdown and the time that it's allowed us, but more in this case you to think about implementing some stuff, you're probably going to be able to at least have some options that you wouldn't have had even time to think about in the past. Maybe you're going to think about them and you're going to go, well, I'm not going to do it um, because it doesn't suit, but I'm going to take time to investigate perhaps. Um, But things like the culture of the clubs, you know, things that I find important as a fan or as a parent yeah. in the NPL system. Um, I understand that there's budget restraints, but can a senior coach get involved in junior development yeah. or setting up a program from junior development? Does, it, does a senior coach at that level, at NPL level, take the time to plan that far ahead? Yeah. That's... Um that's a good. That's a great question. And do, do clubs actually want their senior coach? That's another question. To be involved in yeah. junior development. Yeah, that's it's a whole discussion there because where do the players come from? You know, um, can you be a club that turns over, you know, eleven, twelve players every season because you just want to win the league? Does that then guarantee you to win the league? Um, probably not. Um, are you as a club do you understand whether you are a winning club that's competing for trophies every year or do you understand that you are a club that is producing players Um, do you have that awareness and we and we speak about that all the time at Bulleen you know I'm, I'm I'm very lucky that that we have these discussions and, and, you know, they do listen and there's, there's great people there. So I've mentioned that, you know, before the first, it's just like any coach or any player. The first thing that you need to understand is who you are. What are you, you know, are you a winning club or are you a developing club? Now, if a developing club can win something, then fantastic. But that won't be the process of a 12 month turnaround that has to be a process of three or four or five years down the track. Yeah. Now, to answer your question, does the senior coach, you know, look down the ranks and, you know, 
create this kind of culture with junior players coming through. I think it would be in his best interest to make sure that he knows the players that are coming through the ranks. Um, some players might show that their talent earlier than others, but there still needs to be a process there to make sure to give these players, to give these young kids the platform to be able to express themselves with no shackles. No shackles. They need to be able to be free to play football to then be able to get into an environment where they can express themselves freely under some sort of pressure. So when we look down at the culture, when we look down at at the youth, are we having conversations and most clubs will say yes we're having com- and, and most coaches will say yes we're having conversations with these kids but my question is are you having the right conversations with these kids and with these parents and with the clubs the right conversation needs to be that there needs to be a criteria you know between coaches and club to discuss what is that criteria? What is the right conversation? What are you talking about in these right conversations? Yeah. The right conversation is, you know, your left foot son. If you want to come and play on the left wing, you need to make sure that your left foot is better. Yeah. Now, is that a a correct conversation? What influence are you having on that child's behavior by telling him, that your left foot needs to be better? Or are you just merely stating the obvious? How are you going to change that child's behaviour to make sure that his left foot improves? Right? That's what I'm talking about, the right conversations. And do we have the right knowledge, the right communication skills, the right leadership to be able to have that conversation, not just to the child, but to the families and to the club? I think that's where that's where it becomes really essential, George. Okay. And if you're going to have that honest assessment and critique, we're obviously trying to be positive and constructive. Yeah. I guess then you've got to put measures in place to be able to follow that up with your youth coaches, with your junior coaches, because they've obviously got to come under not necessarily the banner, but they've got to be understanding that you've got project players, for want of a better expression, in the under-15, under-16s, and you've identified them as potential senior players. But yeah. these are the things so that it's not just about then you and the parents and the, the player, uh, but then the, the junior coach is also becomes part of the conversation. Absolutely. So there has to be a process. You know, the senior coach can't come down to the under fifteen and have these conversations with the child and with the and with the with the families. Mm. There needs to be uh, this communication. There needs to be this. Um, you, you know, you said the word culture, but there, there needs to be this talking amongst you know juniors and seniors. Uh, there needs that needs to come together. Whereby that's what the senior team's doing. Everybody underneath, okay. That's that's your gold standard. Yeah. So if we, if if we if we're to be honest, if we have to be honest, let's take bullying for example, right? And let's take the under thirteens. You know, their achievable level right now is MPL seniors. Yes, they can talk about playing for Juventus and Real Madrid and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But there's steps, right? From under thirteens, and you go to under fourteens. Under fourteens, you go to fifteens. Yeah. Eventually, you get to the senior hub. What do we need to do down here to be able to play at this level first and foremost, or to be better than that level, right? So then, that's where the communication has to filter down mm-hmm. with the coaches. Yeah. Are we on the same page? Is everybody on the same page? Yeah. That's, that would be my question. Yeah. If you're not on the same page, are we doing everything in our power to communicate? And, you know, have we implemented that? Have we put a process in place to be able to communicate that? If we have, I think it all comes, it all stems back to, you know, do we know who we really are type of thing? Yeah. You know, once you establish that, then you can kind of move forward. 
of course, the club must have its identity and know if it's a, like you said, a winning club or a, de- a development club. It's hard to be both. Not many clubs can combine the two successfully over a long period of time. Um, I reckon the best at it that I've seen in this country is Melbourne Knights slash Croatia, where they can develop and be very competitive and win. And there's been examples, of course, along the way, but not many clubs can sustain the two together because one tends to whatever. And because we don't have transfer system per se, um, it's it's even harder now for an NPL club to just be honest and say, you know what, we'll be a development club and if people, if we can develop X amount of players over a period of time, we'll sell them to the NSL or we'll sell them to wherever and we'll get our return that way. So the, the lack of a transfer system also makes it difficult to just say we'll just be a development club. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think if measures are put in place, including that coaching structure that we're talking about, um, if you take away just the mentality that we just need to win, yeah, because you can have one eye on being very competitive and winning yeah. and still have a proper process and a proper system and a culture through the club that's developing players to feed into this. <clears throat> yeah, um, And it comes back to culture, which we've been talking about, development, the right people in the right jobs, i.e. like yourself, who understand that your responsibility is not necessarily just to that first team but yeah. to the feeder teams. Yeah. Um, it all I'll, comes down with your values, George. Yeah, values, but also a long-term vision rather than just going, well, I need to go in there um, for the next six months or 12 months and win at all costs. Therefore, I just look for the most expensive or most effective players. Yeah. Short-term fix. And then when things go pear-shaped, you move on or whoever moves on, another coach comes in where, yeah. I think, you know, the the view should be of let's get someone in who can actually – doesn't always work out that way because coaches get sacked, you know. But yeah. Yeah, let's yeah. have a five or seven or ten-year plan revolving yeah. around – a head coach who understands the pyramid that we're based yep. with. Yeah. And if if we have a little bit of success along the way, but we're building, then yep. surely that we can get some sustained success yep. and develop players at the same time. I agree 100%. And the sustained success, I think, comes um, in part or together with your values. Some people might call it football philosophies, right? Yep. I don't know if I agree so much on the football <laughs> philosophy. Yeah. But um, your values, right, of the way that you see football. Because if you said to me, I, I want to go in there and I'm going to win one game, no problem. I'll park the bus, kick the ball out of the park, um, get the ball in the box, put my biggest player up top, maybe he wins a header, we win 1-0, and that's it. Job right? done. Yeah. Job done, right? But is that a sustainable way to produce players to be successful and what values is there behind that methodology because when you talk about values when you talk about philosophy what do people want to see people want to see good football they want to see winning football they want to see entertainment right and that takes time that takes time if you if you look at you know for example if you're if you're a club and you're a team and you're a coach and you look at your stats and you say you know, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, but winning is all that matters. Okay, well, I won, I won that game. Um, you know, the opposition, you know, we won, we won one nil, but the opposition penetrated your defence ten times. They hit the post twice and they missed a penalty. You went up the park twice, crossed it once and scored a, a lucky deflection. Yeah? Now, you can... You can be true and say, you know what, we were lucky. Or you can turn around and say, oh, yeah, but winning is all that mattered. Now, that's where the difference in real football and your football values really count because I would rather know, I would rather know that my team is penetrating the opposition defence at will whenever I want, creating goal-scoring opportunities whenever we want. Okay, we didn't score this game, but... 
and we drew nil nil. But there's going to be more sustainability in that, and there's going to be more success in that because eventually you will win games and continuously, and you will put them back to back because of your values in the way that you see the game and the way that you want to attack that. Does yeah. that make sense? Or oh, absolutely. It's all about the process, not not the end result. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. the processes are, are all put in place, eventually the results will take care of themselves. Absolutely. And that's what I'm, um, I guess that's what I'm le- leading to is it's a, a lot of, and we're talking about bullying because you're the bullying coach, but I'm talking yeah. about all clubs um, in general that have a short term outlook on this and don't appoint coaches with a view to building and sustaining and actually doing the two things together of winning and developing players. They, they find it difficult to, to marry the two up because it becomes maybe too hard or too difficult. So it's kind of like, let's just pick one and let's be that one. Um, and I, that annoys me because I think certain clubs have proven that you can do both, but they've had longer term views. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and again, that also comes back to, Culture that's perhaps 50 to 60 years old and embedded in that club or new cultures that perhaps new committees and change of personnel among the thinking um, and in, I guess, in many cases with the NPL benefactors who pour money in and sponsors that yeah. have to say on the way things are run. Absolutely. Um, again, it's a chopping, chopping and changing environment, the old NPL in many and, ways. And we can link this... To what we were saying to before, where your experiences as a player, you know, can shape the way that you are now as a coach. And, and you know, I said, well, maybe what they did 20 years ago, maybe the coach 20 years ago didn't have to worry about any of this stuff and just had to worry about his dressing room. Yeah. Well, nowadays, the coach needs to, you know, communicate with the dressing room, needs to communicate with the needs to communicate with the benefactors of the club, needs to communicate with board members and owners, needs to communicate with sponsors, um, all these stakeholders, right? So have we got the right people in these leadership roles, in these coaching roles I'm talking about, that have got the skill set and the tools to be able to lead clubs in the right direction? Or are we... Are we, um, you know, taking shortcuts and maybe employing people um, that has just landed on their lap and not taking the time to really research and look into it and assess? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I often throw this up in conversation when I'm having my chats in the pub, but professionalism, Mm. I'll give you my answer. Give me, what's your description? What's your view of what professionalism is in a football environment? Oh, that, that's, that's a very open-ended question, George. Mate, um, in a football environment, like in the changing room, as an individual player, as a coach, as a club? No, well, I, I say to you, it's all about the professionalism, right? I just yeah. throw away line. But yeah. Some people, that means that it's a full-time job, therefore they get paid, therefore end of story. Yeah. Where the description ends. Yeah. So I'm saying to you again, it's all about the professionalism, dot, 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 dot. Mm. You tell me what it means. I think it's about uh, bringing... um, uh, conducting, Conducting yourself in the best way possible that you're going to bring the best version of yourself as an indivi- for, for you as an individual, for your team and for your club. Now, what that best version is, I think in today's society, it's different for everybody. Maybe 20 years ago, this was professionalism, so you had to stick by, you know, you had to be in bed by 10 o'clock, you had to eat this, you had to wake up for breakfast. It's changed now, but 
that's that's the way I see it. If you're bringing the best of yourself for the benefit of your team and for your club mm-hmm. and for yourself individually, then that would be for a desired outcome. That would be my answer to professionalism. Yeah. So it's attitude. So it's not how much you earn or whether you're a full-time person or a part-time person. It's actually the attitude you bring to that particular job. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I think that gets lost on a lot of people, yeah, in a footballing sense, that professional just means I'm paid full-time, therefore I'm a professional. Yeah. And, and you can see a lot of it now. So, so now that this whole pandemic um, hit, you can see it. You can see a lot of discussions around pay in the A-League. You know, we had a lot of discussions around pay in the MPL. Um, you're seeing uh, true characters of um, certain people um, really come out and shine now, some for the good, some for the worse. Um, you know, you, you, the, these attitudes that you're talking about um, are really magnified, especially in, 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 in the moment that we're in just now, George. Yeah, no, certainly it's the interesting times and you are right about witnessing people's reactions to some minor things, some serious things, and, of course, politics at the moment is playing a huge part in our daily lives because we're controlled by the politicians, especially with lockdown and whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we certainly <clears throat> certainly see that. So one of the things one of the one of the things that I that I said when this whole pandemic hit was, can I come out of it with my integrity intact? Yeah, can I come out the other side with my integrity so that I know that I've done everything in my power in this tough time to be the best that I can be. And I tried to relay that onto my on my family and I tried to relay that onto my players and my club. Yeah. Because people don't forget, George. They don't forget. No, of course not. No. So for me, as a an old man who can no longer play and train and whatever. So I, I think about what does a player do through this apart from, you know, the frustrations and the mental side of it. So I've thought about it. What would I think I would do? I guess as best to say, because if I was young, I may not have done this. But I think I would, as a player, I would, at this point in the second wave with the second lockdown, say to myself, "I've had a bit of a break. My, my body's had a chance to relax and whatever, and I've had a chance to switch off." I have an opportunity now to go back to pre-season at some point. We know we're going to get back to pre-season at some point. I want to go back and be the fittest, fastest, strongest athlete back at pre-season training. I don't want to go back to pre-season training and be run of the mill. I don't want to go back to pre-season training and see that we've all dropped away and that we're going to need to go back to scratch. I'm going to actually use this time to actually better myself and maybe even improve on some of my skills, some of my techniques, some of the weaknesses that otherwise when I work full time and I train three, four nights a week that I haven't got time to do any of that in the old environment, but I've had plenty of time off. So now I'm actually going to go out, kick the ball against the wall, work on my first touch, little things like that. So when I go back to pre-season, whether anyone notices or not, I'm going to know that I'm in tip-top shape, mentally and physically ready and going to get on top of this and can't wait for 2021 to start. That's for a player. Yeah. What does a coach now do with all of that in mind to make sure that when you get back, you've improved? What can you have improved what can you be better at when we all turn up, we'll call it in the late December for a pre-season and we know that the game's going to go ahead in February? Mm. Um, I, I believe that it would be a continuation to where we kind of finished off. Um, you should be fresh 
you should be first and foremost ready to understand, take the time to understand what your players went through in this whole second phase. Um, and then, and only then will you be able to understand what you might be able to implement as a team or um, uh, for individuals. Because without that, without understanding your players and you know what their experiences were in the last you know three or four months, um, you might be going in blind. You know, or you know, you might have this uh, notion in your head of the way that you want to do things, the way that you want to implement football. Um, but you might find that um, although 23 of your players have showed up for day one of preseason, 12 of them might not be where you are at mentally because of their experiences that they've had. So my my number one is my number one rule is doesn't matter when we start preseason, it doesn't matter how long we have. I will take that initial period to take my time and to understand where they're at. So there's a lot of assessment really. Oh, yeah. You know, I, you know, we, we, as coaches, we could turn, turn up to day one and say, right, we've had, we've had time off where, you know, you should be fresh. You should be mentally ready to go. We're going to win the league this year. Day one, bang, let's go. George, realistically, it's not like that. No, it's not like that. You know, the, the difference is that, I, th- I think that a, a lot of coaches would probably understand that, but do we have the tools to be able to implement some sort of assessment process to help these players along? Because at the end of the day, they're still young men. They are men, nonetheless. They're men, but they're young men, you know, 26, 27. You know, some of them are just starting to get engaged or find their way this, you know, and, and it's up to us to try and guide them in some sort of way and try and understand them because without putting too much pressure on them because they show up to day one of preseason and they want to enjoy playing football. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, they, want to, yeah. they want to enjoy playing football. They don't want us to add any, any added pressure. Uh, there, there's a couple of analogies. The first one, the, you know, Carlo Angelotti, you know, said players are motivated. They're already motivated, right? The one thing we have to do as coaches is try not to demotivate them. And we do it all the time. Mm. We do it all the time. And then, you know, you've got the other one with Carlos Tevez where he says, mate, we all fell in love playing the game because we were kicking the ball around. We were running around. The ball is what made us fall in love with the game. And then for the first two weeks in preseason, we've got them running around the pitches and running around lakes and running around and doing all like it just it just doesn't make sense, right? We need to as coaches we need to read into these players and we need to understand, you know, what makes them tick. Yeah, no, that's good. And I seem to recall over the last fifty years in many a uh, ball sport that teams that are enjoying their training and enjoying their game plans generally are more successful because they're playing with smiles on their faces and they're looking forward to going into work or into training and wanting to be part of it as opposed to not and being the opposite. Yeah, and it goes full circle, doesn't it? They enjoy it. They might win one or two games and that breeds a little bit of confidence and then they keep on winning and they keep on enjoying themselves. Mm. Um, you know, can, can we facilitate that, George? Can we facilitate that? Or are we so ego-minded, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it egotistic? Is it, are we so egotistic that as coaches, we just want to be the best coaches that we can be and play the best football that we can get, play the best football that we can play because of this ideology that we have in our head? Because I tell you right now, as coaches, we are secondary we are secondary. It's all about the players, George. Yeah. If they're happy, they'll play for you. If they're not happy, you know, you'll be sacked pretty quickly. Yeah, true, true. There's only two types of coaches. Yeah. All right. Well, then, on a more serious note, then I say yeah. let's open up the reserves to some older players. 
there's a, I think that will absolutely help player development going forward. But not totally. I get it. No yeah. one wants to see 30 year olds clogging up the reserves. But yeah. I'd love to see like three 25 to 30 year olds in every reserve team. Um, and maybe in a system where those guys are being viewed to being put through coaching courses by the club to become junior coaches, to become senior coaches, mm-hmm. and they're helping the the 21s or the reserves as it is yeah. uh, grow up faster, grow up quicker, because we do learn so much from our senior pros, but yeah, not if you don't have access to them. No, uh, I, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it too much, George. I don't know how much that process would work. I don't know. I can't really comment on, on it. All I can comment on is that if you're at a successful NPL club, so, for example, like Borleen, where you've built a senior team that is full of great professionals that have achieved something in the game, there is a massive gap between under-20s and senior football. It's massive. Yep. It, it's massive. Agreed. Agreed. Um, there might be maybe one or two that might be able to come across and maybe, you know, play some sort of part in it. But the, the time from when that – and there's obviously, you know, um, exceptions to the rule, obviously, you know. But for the majority of these under-20s players to be regular senior players, I think there's a space of, a, of, of probably three years. It's probably three years. Mm from when they almost finish their under-20 stint to being regular players that you can rely on week in, week out in the senior team is probably three or four years. Yeah. I think that's too much. I think so. And that's part of the thing that I'm not necessarily got the answer to. It's just a suggestion. But trying to work out what is the best way to bridge that gap because I, I feel that the same, I agree with you, that it's too long before you can rely on these young kids week to week basis at the senior level. And I think that at the under 21s is not preparing them as well to be senior players. That's just a personal opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, I suppose what we're trying to say is that the, the three or four year process is probably not a long process, but what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to not lose these players. We're trying well, to not. Yeah. No, no. Guys that are 16 or 17 are in a 21s program. They get to 18 and either the club jump at shadows and pass them yep. on yep. or the kid jumps at shadows and moves on. Yeah. Is it like oh, I've been here 18 months, two years, and I haven't progressed? Probably need to do a three. You know, like I said, outside of the odd exception, um, and there's not many these days, teenagers playing senior MPL. Yeah. So the apprenticeship's probably a three or four-year apprenticeship, but because... For whatever reason, there's this under-21 mental figure there, of yeah. the 21-year-old, that we're, we're thinking, well, if I, by the time I'm 20, I must be playing seniors or I've failed. Well, that's not necessarily the case. No, it's not necessarily the case, no. Everyone, if, you, if you take a backward step, well, then maybe you're hindering yourself by going to Division One or Division Two. Maybe you're enhancing because you need to play with men. Yeah, and this, is where, and this is where the whole mental process comes in, you know, um, as mentors, as coaches, are, are we educating, are we educating enough or well enough, you know, to be able to get these messages across or are we just saying, oh, no, I'm just releasing all these players um, <clears throat> because they're, they're not ready for senior football. And that might be the case with a few of them, but are we, you know, getting that message across. Are we communicating them so that they respect what you're saying? They don't necessarily need to like it, but are they? Do they respect what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, la- last season, um, I I told three or four players that they they weren't ready to play regularly in in my senior team. Um, they were good enough to be in the senior squad, but they they had already spent a full year where they rarely played a minute in the senior environment. But they were ready to play senior football somewhere. So I said to them, you know, Australian football is not really set up to be sending players out on loan and, and all this sort of thing. But 
I said to them, listen, I can speak to a couple of clubs for you. Yeah. They might be in a, in a lower division, but go and play. And I promise you, I'll keep an eye out on you because I want you back. I want an ex bulleen player. I want a product of Bulleen to come back and play in senior football. Yeah. Right? But it's trying to bridge, it's trying to bridge that two-year gap or the three-year gap um, and also getting them to buy in, you know, to the process, which it's very, very difficult because the cultures around football, you know, especially at NPL level, you know, they've got different types of information. You know, if you say something to these kids, do they believe it or do they just go home and believe what their parents are saying? You know, it's just... Uh, Hard to know. Hard to know. And that's one of the wonderful things is the unknowns that are involved in the game that we've got no control over. All right. Mate, I have enjoyed our conversation. I think we've um, spoken about everything and anything to do with coaching. I think we've Fantastic. just... I think we've just sorted out the whole NPL structure and fixed it for everyone. So we'll be able to sell this um, off as a project to everyone and they'll be able to use it as the template for improving things Australia-wide. Yeah, no, no problem. problem. <laughs> you, you, you just make sure you sign off on it, right, George? Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll split it with you 70-30 as we agree. Oh, yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> now, look, I, I just, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm glad to be on your show, George. Um, you are... Uh, Pleasure um, having you on, mate. I respect you. I respect you. Um, you've got a, a real credible program going on here, and I, I listen to it regularly. I watch it regularly, um, and it's a testament to what you're doing, George. And, um, and, and I wish you all the best, mate. You know, I really uh, hope to have another conversation with you at some point down the future. I was just going to say thanks for the kind words. Um, and two and a half years ago, I said that uh, I thought I was expecting uh, bigger and better things and a, a new journey for you. At that time, you went from the under-21s coach, to the senior coach. So why don't we just put it in our diaries and catch up in two and a half years' time and do another interview and see where we're both at and uh, what we've learnt along the way and what we've experienced. It should be interesting. Absolutely, mate. I'll Absolutely. keep an eye on, on your career and obviously I always keep an eye on bullying results, as you know, by the odd text that I send you to wish Absolutely. you more games. Yeah. Uh, we'll keep in touch, but more importantly... Um, Fingers crossed that we get out of this bloody lockdown and get back to some sort of training and playing soon. Yeah, most. I think that's the most important thing. You know, just stay safe and you know make sure that you come out of this with your he um, head held high and and look forward to whatever the football season brings next season. Beautiful, John Mozano. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. <laughs>